good morning everyone welcome to the uh, day 3 uh, we have the, on the first session we have uh, 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 the topic is on vasculopathies uh, i would like to call on dr biplab das sir, he is sir is a consultant neurologist uh, he is from fortis memorial research institute in gurgaon and i would also like to call upon dr vishnu sir uh, he is an assistant professor in the uh, associate uh, professor in the department of neurology in all india institute of medical sciences new delhi Uh, his special inter- areas of interest are neuromuscular disorders stroke vas cns vasculitis sir i would like to request both of you to uh, kindly take over the dais hi good morning everyone and so we are in the day 3 of uh, our stroke summer school it so today starts with a very interesting session on vasculopathies we have three speakers today uh, dr deepthi will be uh, talking on small vessel disease Uh, Dr. Shailaja uh, will be talking on thymus and synovitis, and Dr. Arun Sharma will be talking on arterial dissections. Now, uh, I would well uh, request Dr. Biplab to introduce the first speaker. Yeah, good morning, uh, everyone, and a wonderful Sunday. So, the most important, we are a bit more jubilant because of uh, gold we have after years of uh, you know dryness. So that's uh, anyway. So you can have your coffee, and then we have. Uh, wonderful speakers uh, uh lined up actually and this is a very hot topic of vascular bithi which we are predisposing young stroke and all of this so we look forward to listen all of them and uh, first speaker today is uh, dr deepthi viva uh, she is uh, from all india institute uh, delhi and she is a uh, uh, associate professor there and she is having keen interest in stroke neuro infa- uh, neuro infections and uh, also in public health So may I request, uh, Madam, to uh, start uh, your talk, please. There is one small correction. Uh, Dr. Deepthi is additional professor, and soon to become a professor. <laughs> so that's okay. some uh, typo Sorry. error. Okay. So, I am not correction. associate professor. I am still assistant professor. So there is a typo at both ends. Chief. Thanks for the correction. Thank you. May I request, Madam? Yeah. Yeah. Good morning, everyone. So, like Dr. Paul had predicted yesterday, it's a lazy Sunday morning. Thin audience. chairpersons uh, but i decided to speak uh, in the real school so i have a few students here with me and i hope this uh, thing will be a bit useful because uh, vasculopathies are a group of uh, uh, stroke uh, related uh, issues in which uh, there is a lot of scope of uh, treatment and the treatment is different and if you don't identify it then you miss out on a lot of uh, morbidity which you can potentially save in these patients so uh, i will navigate uh, uh, in this topic in the following headings i'll talk a bit about the how this nomenclature came into being about the small vessel disease the history and evolution uh, there is no single definition so the definitions that we have for small vessel disease when to suspect how to diagnose how to confirm and lastly and most important how to manage so first let us talk about the history in uh, 1965 uh, miller fisher described detailed clinical pathological correlations in classical ischemic lacunar uh, stroke syndromes so he described about atherosclerosis or thickening or damage to the arterial wall which is called as lipohyalinosis now remember when you talking about small vessel disease uh, uh, basically why is it uh, defined as a different entity is that in small arteries and arterioles there is absence of com- continuous elastic lamina and that is the basic difference when we are talking about large vessels uh, medium vessel and then small vessel disease and that is why it is a distinct separate category so uh, uh, there is obstruction of the origins of the penetrating arteries by the parent large artery intimal plaque so another pathological process of deep cerebral vessels that affects the veins is called collagenosis so it is it is a composite of the arterioles yes the capillaries and then the draining uh, venules also uh, are a part of the small vessel disease now there is less than 50% agreement amongst neuropathological centers in its definition so that is why i felt that there is a need to classify what small vessel disease actually is so if you look at the 2010 paper and then there is a subsequent 2019 paper they have had a lot of differences in the in the uh, in the fact even that you know the later paper does not deal with the classification of diseases because it has become so complex that they they say that you know it is not by 
uh, a simple neuropathological classification, but it would be by a composite of clinical features, imaging, and pathology. So one thing alone cannot be enough to classify a small vessel disease in, in a completeness. So type 1 is basically what we are all most familiar about is atherosclerosis or age-related or vascular-related small vessel disease. Type 2 is sporadic or hereditary cerebral amyloid angiopathy. Now you would have you know, come across these terms in a lot of patients that we see uh, in whom there are lobar bleeds and microbleeds associated with that. So this particular entity also comes under the ambit of small vessel disease. Then there are genetic or inherited small vessel disease distinct from cerebral amyloid angiopathy. And then this category, you would have the same pathology like atherosclerosis, but the age group in which you expect this to happen would be different, yes? So they would not have the conventional uh, atherosclerotic risk factors and they would be young. So they would have an underlying genetic condition which expedites the whole process and makes the small vessels age earlier than they would naturally be. And then the most important uh, about which, you know, maybe the subsequent speakers will be talking about in a little more detail is the inflammatory immunologically mediated small vessel disease, right, in which there is inflammation. And this is important because the treatment of the first three and the, then the last one is completely different. So that is why it is important that you understand this etiopathogenic classification. I have, I have stuck to that old definition uh, and I've not taken the new one. I will be talking about it, but this looks a little more easy to understand and remember. So that is why, you know, there is one which is conventional small vessel disease because of atherosclerosis. The second is amyloid angiopathy, which is a different pathology, of course, and a different clinical presentation as well. The third is the expedited form of small vessel disease because of an underlying genetic situation and the fourth is inflammatory or immunologically mediated right after that you know uh, you know that this newer definition which was uh, in the continuum 2020 so a small vessel disease is a multifaceted cerebrovascular syndrome that is composed of clinical neuropathological and neuroimaging like i'd already told you when i was you know trying to make a you know, a background for what, why I'm not talking about the definitions and not definition, because there has been a shift in the way you are thinking about the different, you know, classifying small vessel disease. So it's, so it affects a small caliber vessels, which includes arterioles, which have a diameter of less than 0.1 millimeter. So, you know, you cannot see them by the conventional angiography and that is why it is important. It is more the damage which this small vessel disease does to the target tissue, which is visible in the imaging rather than the vessel itself. Then the capillaries, the venules, and it results in either acute, chronic, and progressive or accumulating injury. So another important thing to remember here is that it doesn't present always like a stroke stroke syndrome. It might present with a myriad of symptoms and you might find things suspicious on, uh, on a radiology as well as in the clinical uh, features that might help you to suspect about this entity that the patient has small vessel disease. Now, uh, this is again from the 2010 earlier paper classification and it has further classified, you know, I had already talked about the four big entities and then in the atherosclerosis, you have fibrinoid necrosis, you have lipohyalonesis, you have microetheroma, microaneurysms and segmental arterial disorganization. Then the second thing is the sporo uh, sporadic hereditary cerebral amyloid angiopathy. In the inherited forms, I had not named them, but now you have a big list on this slide, which is Cadacil, Caracil, uh, Melas, Fabry's disease, and several other call for A1 uh, mutations, uh, to name a few. I'll be dealing about them in a little more detail in the subsequent slides. And type 4 is the inflammatory where of the big group in which, you know, any young stroke comes, you invariably investigate for these causes which is vaginus, Schurkstrauss, microscopic uh, polyangitis, inoxial and purpura, cryoglobulinemic vasculitis, and connective tissue disorders, which are systemic, and the brain bears a secondary brunt as a part of the in overall systemic disease. And of course, there's a five fifth uh, thing, which is a little more poorly classified, uh, which is strictly not a separate entity, which is of venous collagenosis. But because it is under the ambit of, you know, the small vessel disease, 
it is classified separately however you would not have you know specific diagnosis saying that you know it is only affecting the venues it would be a part and parcel of the bigger thing in which you know either it would be a genetic atherosclerotic or immunological right so and then of course other small vessel disease which are beyond what i have described so far you know like post radiation which also causes inflammation but you know that's a separate Uh, classific class in itself and non amyloid uh, microvascular degeneration like happens in alzheimer's disease because of the accumulation of tau proteins now uh, the newer definitions in the small vessel disease uh, stroke is the presentation in one fourth and and all a lot of hemorrhagic strokes as well especially low bar it might present as i told you that it can present like you know stroke but not always like stroke it can also present with rapidly progressive cognitive decline and gait imbalances mood disorders so what you would see on the imaging as a corroborate of small vessel disease would be white matter hyperintensities lacunes microbleeds perivascular spaces enlarged and recent small subcortical infarcts when you see that on imaging you know it is small vessel disease but depending upon the patient profile depending upon the other things which i've told you earlier you would further like to classify the etiology without actually you know taking a biopsy of that tissue so endothelial dysfunction is something which is integral to any type of small vessel disease irrespective of the etiology so what happens is that the arterioles lose their ability to contract and dilate so is a loss of elasticity to match the blood supply and demand and that leads to relative ischemia so the vessel stiffens so that the pulsatility of the pulse wave increases so lead with that leads to diminished flow and in the perivascular spaces and there is this um, now this i have taken from the 2019 paper yes the recent one which talks about a neuroglyovascular unit what's a neuroglyovascular unit it's a composite of endothelial cells pericytes astrocytes oligodendrocytes and neurons so you would um, you would draw corollary to you know a motor uh, unit so it's a composite in which you have the blood brain barrier and you have i think i will use this for so you have the blood brain barrier which consists of pericytes basement membrane endothelial cells and tight junctions now whenever that is damaged you lead to that leads to decreased elasticity increased permeability then result in tissue damage the etiology of the breakage of this blood brain barrier would be several like i've already told you but it it in uh, in uh, entity you know it in whole it it affects the neuroglyovascular unit so this is a kind of a you know relatively new term which has been coined but it gives you a hang of that you know it's not only a vasculopathy as such it affects the vessels primarily but then it affects the astrocytes it affects the tissue and it also affects the vessels right so when we talk about pathophysiology we know that the blood brain barrier dysfunction can occur naturally like in you know aging brain atherosclerosis it can be accelerated by fox for two linked sporadic small vessel disease and stroke so there can be genetic conditions in which despite you know you have a healthy lifestyle you have everything that will you have you have age on your side and still you're getting strokes and small vessel disease so there might be a genetic predisposition we all know about the notch 3 mutation yes and and of course vascular dementia and alzheimer's disease also have a small vessel disease as a part to play not the primary thing but yes a part to play in the whole process now when should we suspect i told you that you know the clinical features are highly variable uh, uh, you know uh, in a striking difference to what would be very clearly clinical like a stroke syndrome uh, small vessel disease in in addition to stroke might also present with just cognitive decline gait problems apathy mood disturbances depression personality changes extra pyramidal syndromes as well as there would be structural and functional underpinning in widely distributed neuronal networks by this we mean you know the small if the white matter deep white matter is involved then depending upon the tracts and networks which are involved there is no limit to the type of you know of clinical features that such patients would present with so you can have any myriad of symptoms and there would be underlying small vessel disease which you could only clinically suspect 
once you have a unusual presentation and then you have a corroborative imaging to to make you you know step further on that uh, clinical suspicion so uh, so there are small vessel disease uh, disease related uh, lesions which the clinical presentation of which would depend upon the location whether it is an infarct or a hemorrhage so even in the in the in the imaging you would not only find just a white matter hyperintensity the lots of other things which you can find and we'll be talking about it uh, maybe in the next 5 minutes and then that would lead to secondary new neurodegeneration like it happens in you know gray, gray matter and its connected white matter structure and of course we already talked about the resilience factors uh, which are affected as a result of small vessel disease and it definitely depends upon the extent so the volume and the location of the lesion though this is familiar but let me ask you something so a patient comes to you with uh, a minor stroke you see a lacuna on the imaging yes so what do you think what do you think what happens does it uh, does it regress over time you know because the patient improves <laughs> so the patient's impression is if i am getting better my image is also getting better right so the lacuna you know they, they usually ask you for a repeat mri ki dekh li jo khatam ho gaya hai ki nahi so does it does it you know does it regress or it atrophies or it recovers does it remain the same what you are going to tell the patient you know it is going to remain the same you know you are going to improve but your lacuna is going to remain there does it expand you know or does do you do, do you know even if you don't get strokes you might have new things coming up on the image or you know you just have a cavity a hole a scar mark as you would say so what is the fate of a incident white matter hyper hyper intensity what is the commonest fate i mean i have told you and i've shown you this diagram so of course you are intelligent enough to guess that it can go all the ways but but if somebody asks you you know which direction am i going to go doctor what are you going to tell them depends on the risk factor so control of risk factors so you'll tell look if you control your risk factors you might go here or here otherwise you're going to go progress here okay but but you know as a doctor you're going to give a common prescription to everybody and you are going to counsel this also to everybody so despite that despite you know what we what we would see the best medical treatment uh, what would you think do all of them go this way or 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 you know some go here despite whatever you do they do progress so you know you're lying to all your patients yeah <laughs> no it doesn't happen that way so so to test this hypothesis there is a dutch study which is the run dmc study now it is interesting because because this is a question which would have cropped up in everybody's head would be sitting in the outpatient and looking at a lacuna in fact and a patient telling you you know look at this mri and i've got this in 6 months later because i felt you know i'm completely all right has my lesion disappeared so they looked at 276 patients and they assessed it three time points over nine years to look at you know how is the lacuna behaving so you know they they follow that lacuna over the period of nine years so the mean white matter hyperintensity progression over nine years was like 4.7 ml and 20.3% had incident lacunes and and i i would assume that they all received medical treatment with comparable levels of you know non compliance in each group and everything but anyways 18.9% had incidental bleed so if you have to remember you know grossly 20 20 around like for each group and it also declined it declined in 10% about 10% so 9.4% during the first follow up only one participant out of this whole group of 294 had uh, you know uh, decrease and the lacunes disappeared in 3.6% and 5.7 so it's not impossible that for them to decrease or disappear altogether and uh, patients with the uh, minor risk i think i have a plot also after that i'll show you yeah so so this is interesting because it tells you that over a period of time you know there would be some who would so, so you know they've segregated each one into a single line each patient is a line and this is at baseline and this is at 9 years so if you plot the graphs you would see that there would be people for for all the people in whom it decreased it was on it was green which remained static in you know in the second quartile 
it was blue and therefore and in you know in a majority of them there was a slight increase so you see that this this band is the thickest stable is again the thickest and there would be odd few in which it would decrease and then there would be another odd few in which it would increase so whatever hypothesis we're telling here has been actually quantified beautifully in a paper and you see that you know uh, you can tell the patients that that the white matter hyperintensities might decrease or increase we we can make our best efforts but they would be apart from treatment there would be other factors now they also have studied what are the factors which would uh, which would determine this like you know so has told us that if you control the blood pressure blood sugar stop tell the patient to stop smoking they might you know go in a good way so uh, there was another paper which looked at white matter hyperintensities from baseline to one year and this was a smaller study but participants in whom white matter hyperintensity decreased had a higher bp at baseline compared to participants in whom white matter hyperintensity is increased now this is not counterintuitive but this only means that the delta or the difference in the blood pressure from the baseline to the to the time when they were eventually followed up at one year was greater yes so don't encourage patients to have a high baseline blood pressure that doesn't mean that second is that it decreased when there were larger reductions so it's a way of analysis but the way to interpret is that if you have a better reduction of blood pressure to the optimum blood pressure you have a higher likelihood that the white matter hyperintensity might decrease in the subsequent imaging how does it translate to clinical recovery is not the main realm of this paper but yes most of the patients recover in minor stroke and lacunes you know that if they have optimally treated uh, blood pressure so uh, with the in patients in whom white matter hyperintensity increased there were more recurrent cerebral vascular events so there were more incident strokes so the hypothesis that we started with 5 minutes back actually is true that if you control the vascular risk factors you can actually hope the imaging to get better over time and that is something which you can tell your patients right now now that we have suspected let us see how we can diagnose and the corner store of diagnosis here is apart from clinical is the imaging so i would spend a little more time on the imaging here and talk about what are the definitions you know we talk a lot about uh, these uh, entities and we use them loosely and sometimes interchangeably uh, when we are talking about uh, the radiological features so what is a lacune the size should be less than 15 mm and you identify it best by a flare uh, and you exclude other differentials by doing other sequences then a recent subcortical infarct so you can again uh, you know detected by a dwin and i have the images so i'll show you the images also how these all these but you should you should know that all these you know entities are different entities so lacune subcortical infarct white matter hyperintensities enlarged perivascular spaces cerebral microbleeds cortical superficial sclerosis this is something which is less identified you know we don't emphasize a lot of this when you're seeing our radiologies but after this class i think you should try and identify them in your subsequent you know images when you see them and then cortical micro infarcts which is interesting because because that is also something which is very much underplayed and not looked at and also of course not a very common thing to find so you should look for it and see because it gives you a lot of insight into what you're looking for so as i told you the best imaging to look for a lacune would be a flare imaging and you would see it like a small speck like then 15 mm for a superficial sclerosis a gre sequence would be good you see this black curvilinear thing here so those are those are iron deposits suggestive of superficial sclerosis i'll talk about how and why they are formed then in large perivascular spaces or car robin spaces like you see i mean in the context of small vessel disease they are important because they would be enlarged normally also you would see them with uh, with aging and in a degenerative brain but if you see them with other biomarkers now these are all biomarkers of small vessel disease so if you see them with other biomarkers they go in favor of a small vessel disease and you see them best in a t2 weighted image then again in a flare image you know that you know because there's a contrast between the csf space the periventricular space and and the abnormal white matter uh, flare is a good sequence to look at white matter lesions and um, microbleed we we are our radiologists have made us quite expert in this by looking at the swi images in all our radiology conferences so we know that the microbleeds look like small specks of uh, dark uh, dots in a swi image 
And finally, in the DWI, you can look for the cortical microinfarcts. So, so this is this part is a zoomed in image of this small little thing. You should look at this because this tells you that there is active thing going on, which can be even seen on a pathology. So when we talk about microinfarcts, they are a composite of neuropathology uh, and, and, and as well as an imaging uh, uh, modality and a composite of that can help us to diagnose whether there is a cortical microinfarct. So the spatial resolution would be moderate by a DWI, but it will, it will show you a microinfarct in a hyperacute stage. So in, if it is less than two, two weeks, it will show you. And uh, if we are able to do a pathology sometimes, we can see very characteristic pathological landmarks like, you know, you see a red hypoxic neuron there. You, you can see in, a, in, a, in the same resolution a chronic slick like microinfarct. So on a DWI, you would only see an acute microinfarct, which is less than two weeks. But then let's say uh, if you do a pathology or if you are able to successfully do a biopsy in such a patient, you would be able to see the microinfarct. And in a chronic infarct, you can even see cavitations and uh, you can see hemosiderin deposits, right? So then we talk about, apart from the, you know, the atherosclerotic, there are monogenic forms of cerebral uh, small vessel disease. So in a young patient, if you are seeing small vessel disease with characteristic radiological findings, uh, you should draw a detailed family tree. You should try to decipher if the patient falls into any of these syndromes. And it will be worthwhile to, you know, label these patients because they keep on running to different centers because they're going on getting repeated strokes and events and having deterioration in their neurological function. And they don't get a proper label. So Cadacil is one which would present with, uh, you know, territorial strokes, interparenchymal. They can present with dementia, depression, migration, think, uh, um, uh, migraine, as well as, uh, you know, that it is autosomal. Is it, Wait, so? It's more than 25 minutes. If you okay, okay. So I, I will yeah. be winding up. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, so they, and Cadacil, which is autosomal recessive, amyloid angiopathy and call for a one which we have talked about. And then the other in the list are Fabry's disease, homocystinuria, melas. We routinely investigate for all these patients in young strokes. But remember that if you have those radiological markers, you should not miss out on anyone from the list. And doing all of them would be cost prohibitive. So you have to draw, therefore, you know, a proper family charge. You have to look at the... Uh, exclusive clini clinical manifestations which might come with each of them, you know, like the retinal pathology would be there in a few, uh, the, the personality changes would be another few. So depending upon the, the, uh, the organ involved, the characteristic feature there, you should tailor your investigations. Now, to confirm, uh, I am just looking at the cerebral amyloid angiopathy part because that is something which has a different treatment and that can be very nicely diagnosed on a histopathology. So when we are you know, thinking about a cerebral amyloid angiopathy, we know that one, one type is the one in which there is degenerative amyloid deposition in which we can't really do much and these patients present with the uh, lobar bleeds, but there would be another entity which is associated with inflammation. And uh, so CA can be sporadic in which you just see bland amyloid. And there would be another one which would be associated with inflammation. Now, if you have this type of a, a histopathology feature, uh, and sometimes we don't have, and we only suspect it clinically, these are more responsive to immunotherapies. There are no large trials, but case series have shown that these patients treated on a long-term steroid would have stabilization and even benefit in the uh, course of the disease. Right. And uh, for the management, uh, the management is same as well as different. So, you know, if you, depending upon the etiology. Can you, uh, yeah, sure. Uh, Can you touch? Yeah, 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 sure. So, so you have antiplatelets, antihypertensives, statins. There are new things which are on the way, which are, uh, uh, you know, um, Tadafil and, uh, uh, and there was one more trial on nitric oxide and uh, allopurinol which is on the way. So there are some things, neuroprotective agents, which are uh, on, on an eye ongoing trial and there's some which are already established. So to summarize, we, have, we, can, we should identify these diseases at early stage. 
primary prevention is possible right it is possible especially in patients who have genetic syndromes and you identify that there is a family member who would also be potentially affected you can do primary prevention in such patients you can identify the genetic syndromes secondary prevention is very much possible and the areas of further exploration are basically neuroprotection blood brain barrier stabilizers imagine you know we talked about a neuroglioblastular unit if you are able to hit that then we are sorted so and then of course prevention of oxidative stress which is the common you know final pathway for for the damage thank you and if there are any questions i'll be happy to take so dr ditti it is a very the very interesting talk so do we have any questions i can't say anything in the q and a anybody from resident on the stay there in the, the conference hall wants to ask a question yeah uh, i am i have a question i am kumar abey no yeah I, please sir go ahead when you do as a mr brain in a patient in majority of patients past 50 we see those small vessel ischemic changes that's a general report given when you see that do we do we need to give the antiplatelets on statins so sir uh, uh, the patient has symptoms of also consistent with no, small no 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 he is asymptomatic he is a diabetic he got say vertigo for instance vestibulopathy we do an mr and mr shows this small vessel ischemic because i see quite a few prescriptions from outside ecosprin av or what what i mean to say aspirin plus statin or clopid plus statin are being prescribed my point is is it logical so so I primary prevention do i don't do that but is it logical that's what i want no so so there are studies on primary prevention in patients who have you know risk factors uh, like diabetes and hypertension and giving aspirin as a primary preventive measure is that is that required or not so there are large trials which have shown that and even observational cohort studies which have shown that they don't have an, any additional benefit and uh, uh, so therefore you know doing a primary prevention in this patients especially of course if they have diabetes with triopathy then that becomes a exclusive group in which you can still give aspirin for for dam you know prevention of damage to other end organ thing but primarily per se for the prevention of small vessel disease you would hit the primary vascular risk factors rather than giving him off hand aspirin and saying that you know that will take care of everything yeah so the message to the resident should be that don't prescribe antiplatelets with statin when you have only small vessel ischemic changes on them yeah so so and basically not related, related to any clinical uh, that that right yeah thank you thank you thank you sir